The world can be cold. The streets can be even colder. And the rate of homelessness in Colorado, one of the worst in the country. Thousands of people desperate for food and shelter. And officials admit more has to be done. In this Denver 7 special presentation, we're going to take a closer look at the crisis surrounding people experiencing homelessness and how the community and the government are coming to help. Now, thank you for joining us for this Denver 7 in-depth report. I'm Shannon Ogden. Homelessness is trending in the wrong direction nationwide and here in Colorado. A report from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development suggests on any given night in 2020, more than 580,000 people had no place to call home. Denver was recently listed as the 39th worst city for its homeless rate. More than 4,000 people living on the streets here. And among states, Colorado the 11th worst for the rate of homelessness, increasing nearly 2% over last year. Well, the good news is, though, people are stepping up to help those struggling right now. And that's where we find our CB Cotton, who spoke with a volunteer and her daughter trying to make a difference. Wrap so you could cover your food. As the line grows, people are fed from full trays by a woman with a full heart. Hi, sweetheart. Hi. Thanks for being here. Thank you for being here, too. And we're here to support our community and the families in our community. Specifically, the unhoused community. It takes a lot more to organize all of this, but <laughs> still we come out here for one hour. So one hour, twice a week, is the way Tara De La Fuente supports those facing homelessness. It was noticing that the disparities in the homeless population began increasing more since COVID a year ago. According to new research from the Economic Roundtable, the homelessness crisis is expected to peak by 2023 as a result of COVID-19 related job loss. So Tara says she wants to act now. Since late December, every week, twice a week, Tara and volunteers set up on Curtis Street with food and clothing. We come out here Tuesday and Thursday, four to five. Over the months, more people were on the streets and living in what they call tent city. We don't have affordable housing. We don't have safe indoor space for people to go to. Uh, the cost of living is only getting higher and higher in our community. Gentrification is real. To help with those concerns, Tara has enlisted the help of many volunteers, but she carries the bulk of the supplies in her small car. And those who know Tara say she could use something bigger and more reliable. Tara has really struck me as one that hit my heart. So Jesse Vogel started a GoFundMe page to help raise money for supplies and better transportation. I saw her being very kind to the homeless and just um, going very out of her way to make an impact in their lives. From witnessing her for week after week and a new get up, a new whip would definitely help her out. We even have more distributions coming still today. Jesse thinks I need a van and yeah, a van. Even somebody else told me I needed a truck. So I do believe having bigger transportation to help us get around the community and to support the community would be helpful. But Tara, a Colorado native and PhD student, not quick to ask for help. What's one hour of my day? So Vogel knows people will have to ask for her. That's what I've resolved. Because Tara's full heart. How you guys doing I'm over here? I haven't she's providing full plates and the line continues to grow. CB Cotton, Denver 7. And now it's your turn. If you can spare money for Tara's efforts, head to the DenverChannel.com. Click on Denver 7 Gives tab. There you can find a link that says Help Tara Feed Homeless. And you can make a difference today. The COVID-19 pandemic has also set new challenges for the homeless community and its advocates. Denver city leaders invested $24 million in the city's housing and shelter programs in April. They extended three contracts with the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless and the Salvation Army. Advocates say the plan is helping protect people experiencing homelessness from being exposed to COVID. Well, homeless advocates say the transitional housing also gives them a place and chance to find jobs, get their paperwork in order. One of the things that it's taught us is that 24 seven shelter is really beneficial for the people who stay there because then they can get services on a longer term basis rather than moving from location to location. Those individuals have been housed now long term with remarkable housing stability outcomes and many less interactions with the criminal justice system, which is a both a cost saver as well as a um, you know, it's just better for the community. More than 300 people who were experiencing homelessness now have stable housing thanks to this program. And while the programs were extended to support the homeless population during the pandemic, many of the programs could continue well after it's over. 
The Colorado Coalition for the Homeless also secured a new housing project earlier this year worth $46.5 million. This facility will house up to 98 people, have a 75-bed area to help people recover from things like substance abuse. Organizers say the project will help up to 500 people a year, and that housing may help them land jobs and get back on their feet. The facility will go up at 2175 California Street. That's behind the Stout Street Health Center and the Re Renaissance Stout Street Lofts. And one of the hurdles helping the homeless populations is giving them a chance to afford a place of their own. A tall order in Denver where rent is high and gets higher every year. And that's why state lawmakers are hoping to let cities and municipalities regulate affordable housing and new development projects. Denver 7 Sloan Dickey was that. As housing prices across Colorado continue to increase, a potential new law targets simple economics. It is basic economics. Housing affordability has to do with supply and demand, and we have less supply and more demand. The state's seen some of the largest increases in housing prices anywhere across the U.S., a trend that started before the current pandemic, but has continued to this day. And it's statewide. This is not a front range issue. You. It's not a mountain issue. An obvious solution to higher prices is mandating affordable housing. The current legislation is really, really simple. The problem, Colorado doesn't allow cities to mandate their own affordable housing laws. About 20 years ago, a Supreme Court ruling um, passed a decision that said that inclusionary zoning is a form of rent control. Rent control is constitutionally prohibited by Tabor. House Bill 21-117 is trying to reverse that decision. And so um, what this law seeks to do is uncouple rent control from inclusionary zoning. The bill allows cities to regulate development in order to promote the construction of new affordable housing units. Thereby restoring that local authority to local government. The goal is to allow cities to regulate prices themselves as Colorado continues to grow. And this is just another way to keep our eye on that ability to develop and grow um, effectively. And perhaps bring the American dream in Colorado within reach once again. Sloan Dickey, Denver 7. Another safe space for people experiencing homelessness is poised to go up in the Park Hill neighborhood. Not all the neighbors are happy about it though. Denver 7's Ivan Rodriguez stopped by the Park Hill United Methodist Church and learned the people trying to help the less fortunate caught some of the community members off guard. Park Hill United Methodist Church's parking lot will be home to Denver's newest homeless sanctioned camp, replacing the current one in Cap Hill. But neighbors right across the street are frustrated over a lack of communication and say they're concerned about how it will be managed. I think it was disbelief. For many people in the Park Hill neighborhood, they're just now hearing about this new neighbor, a safe outdoor space that will offer refuge for some 50 people. It just didn't seem logical that they would put a, a homeless camp on a paved parking lot of the church. Understandably, there are a lot of questions about what it will look like and how it will be run, but there's also frustration over the lack of communication from Park Hill United Methodist Church that this was even coming. But I mean, the time to have had the conversation was before. It was not our intent to disregard the community. It just came out before we were ready. We felt that we needed to tell our church first. After seeing the success of the SOS site outside Denver Community Church, Laura Rainwater says they felt comfortable bringing a sanctioned camp to the neighborhood. Somewhere around here will be the beginning of the fence line, and that's where there'll be a one entrance, one exit that will be um, monitored at all times. The success at the Cap Hill site, including the placement of several former homeless people into places of their own, has been the work of Cole Chandler. Five people in tiny homes, two into housing so far, and we've got two more that are about to be moving out. Chandler says only the people who live in the safe outdoor space will have access to the services they provide. We bring mental health and physical health and dental health services to the site. We bring outreach workers and case management to the site. We bring meals to the site every single day. We have trash and bathrooms and all the things that uh, we all need in order to survive. And despite neighborhood apprehension, he's committed to easing concerns through proof of their work. I really hope that Park Hill neighbors can hear me authentically saying that we want to be good neighbors. Neighborhood meetings are scheduled to take place in the coming weeks. The new SOS is set to open June 1st. Ivan Rodriguez, then verse 7. A church in Fort Collins planning to convert its own property into affordable housing. The Heart of the Rockies Church is working with local nonprofits to transform nine acres of land into a ho affordable housing space. The plan is to have 72 apartment units, 10 housing units, and two houses. The senior minister there says the plan is to help the homeless population in more ways than one.
It doesn't mean that we're going to pack in uh, buildings on every square inch. Our proposal is within uh, the existing zoning for this space. It still allows for some green space for a community center, for the expansion of our community garden. And so we really do envision a holistic, thriving community. Organizers hope to complete the project within the next three to five years. More Coloradans are getting vaccinated for COVID every day, but the homeless still need a lot of help. We're going to take a look at how religious communities are helping get shots through their arms. And not all Denverites have the same amount of patience with a homeless community after their own health and safety were jeopardized. How the city and homeless advocates responded. Religious groups are also trying to vaccinate as many people living on the streets as possible. Kai Beach stopped by the Trinity United Methodist Church here in Denver to get a closer look at their efforts. As millions of Americans get vaccinated for COVID-19, many in the homeless community are reluctant to do so. Something religious leaders are trying to change one shot at a time. Some people don't, don't care or they just don't really believe in the virus. For some people living on the streets, their skepticism about getting the COVID-19 vaccination. A lot of people believe in hoaxes and government and stuff like that, so a lot of people think it's control to, to kill people off. Now religious leaders are working to change that by opening the doors to their places of worship and turning them into vaccination sites. A church that has faith without works is dead. Ken Brown is the senior pastor at Trinity United Methodist Church. Getting ready to rock and roll. And a lot of people lined up. Yeah, absolutely. He recently teamed up with a homeless shelter and state health officials to create a COVID-19 vaccination clinic with an emphasis on vaccinating the homeless. We're incredibly excited that we have this pop-up clinic opportunity to vaccinate at least 500 people. And 200 of those spots are folks that live without shelter. Health experts say vaccinating the homeless is beneficial to even those not living on the streets. We have to protect so many more people than what we might think. And it's not just about going to work or school. It's, it's everyone in the community that, you know, it's gonna protect the whole. Dr. Cheryl Zadowitz is an infectious disease specialist. She says vaccinating members of the homeless community will help stop the spread of COVID-19. But getting people to actually get vaccinated does come with some challenges. You know, when you just don't have that secure housing situation, it's just hard to track. And, and then to also, particularly if it's the two dose vaccination, getting to that second dose. And some of these people that just won't go, I don't understand it. Rebecca Rowland is homeless and did get vaccinated but says many others living on the street didn't, something she hopes to change. There are things out there, resources, but you have to search them out. Let's put an end to this. I'm Kai Beach reporting. Denver Mayor Michael Hancock pointed out hospitalizations for COVID-19 were three times higher among people experiencing homeless than the city average. And today, as you know, all Colorado adults are eligible to get the vaccine free of charge. You don't need an ID or you don't even need to be a citizen to get one. Now, another issue in Denver that's been the subject of a federal class action lawsuit, homeless sweeps. At the end of last year, a judge ordered the city to give a week's notice before conducting them. And that issue came back up recently when a fire started at a homeless camp near the A-line, just uh, near East 41st Avenue and Josephine Streets. Now, the fire spread too close for comfort near an industrial storage area with dozens of propane tanks and also burned four power poles, leaving nearly 2,000 residents in the dark. And that prompted Denver's Public Safety Department to move out that homeless camp. Homeless advocates say it should have followed the injunction, but the department's executive director and neighbors near the scene of the fire says something has to be done. Every day they were starting fires and we called firefighters, we called the city, we called police. It was a propane storage area where um, a propane company stored tons of propane. And I, when I say tons, I mean literally tons of propane, which would have taken out multiple city blocks. One person living in the camp told Denver 7 they had 15 minutes to get their stuff and leave. Robinson says the city was within the injunction order because of those imminent safety concerns. And that is not the first incident involving the homeless population that's made day to day living difficult. One woman who is legally blind and has a guide dog told Denver 7 she couldn't walk on the sidewalk near the Capitol because of a homeless camp. I told them to move so that I could 
safely pass. And they were very, very angry at me. Trying to live with a major disability is very difficult. I don't expect the city to spend money, extra money on me. I just want the city of Denver to make it possible for those of us who are disabled to travel safely. The Americans with Disabilities Act allows for temporary disruptions in service as long as a state and a local entity address these problems as soon as possible. The Denver Department of Transportation and Infrastructure said the seven day notice rule would hold them up from clearing the sidewalks immediately. And Aurora Mayor Mike Kaufman went undercover among the homeless to better understand the problem. He lived on the streets for a week and afterward he told Denver 7 some people experiencing homelessness are making quote a lifestyle choice. I do think that what I saw as a common denominator in the encampments was was drug use uh, and namely uh, crystal methamphetamine. Somebody who is homeless has to want to change. And, and quite frankly, I didn't see that uh, in these encampments. The, the difference between the homeless who, who go to shelters uh, and access those for services and the homeless that reside in the encampments, that, that they're mutually exclusive. One of Aurora's former homelessness program directors called Hoffman's actions, quote, a shallow performative exercise. Kaufman said the experience changed his perspective. Aurora City officials tell Denver 7 there's been no movement on the camping ban ordinance's approval process to date. Now, whether through the state or by acts of kindness, anyone can be an everyday hero for the homeless. And one Littleton girl is certainly proving it. Find out how she's helping them one watercolor painting at a time. As we have seen throughout this special presentation, there's no easy solution to homeless problems, but one Littleton girl, six years old, helping out in her own colorful way. Denver 7's Molly Hendrickson introduces us to Lillian Benedict, one of our youngest Denver 7 everyday heroes. Like most artists, little Lillian Benedict has always had the gift of empathy. She's just in tune to the world around her, um, and she soaks it all in. So when she saw the growing number of desperate panhandlers near her grandma's home, well, that just didn't sit right with the six-year-old. There's like lots of people on the street, like, like holding up signs, and I, and I wanted to help them. And so she went to mom with an idea. And she said, I want to sell my paintings. I want to help the homeless. And my instant thought was, that's amazing. I don't know how to do this. <laughs> Together, they came up with Lillian's Big Heart Art and sent this video. Hello, my name is Lillian Benedict. To Littleton's Graceful Cafe with a proposal. I'm hoping to give them to you. Uh, and you can give them and you can sell them to your customers if they want them. If they would display and sell her watercolor paintings, she would donate all of the proceeds to the cafe's foundation, which helps feed the homeless through its Grace in Action meals. It just touched my heart. Cafe owner Heather Greenwood was blown away. Such a young age, you know, she's six and she just has such a beautiful heart already. Lillian now spends hours painting in her art room. I probably do two or three a day after school. Her paintings have sold to people in Georgia and Iowa. Oh, even from Canada. To date, she's raised a thousand dollars for the Graceful Foundation. It's amazing. It's going to feed about a hundred people, which is, is unbelievable. I was just amazed at the support and the, I think the encouragement that she was receiving. People have been deeply moved by Lillian's art, but even more so by the artist and her watercolor reminders of just what's possible if we could all see the world through the empathetic eyes of a six-year-old. We were so inspired with what you're doing that on behalf of Denver 7 and American Financing, we want to honor you as a Denver 7 everyday hero. Congratulations, this is for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, homelessness in the Centennial State has gotten worse, but thanks to generous people and viewers like you, people experiencing homelessness can get by, and there's always ways to help. Head to our website, thedenverchannel.com, to learn more and to view any of these stories. Now, thanks for watching this special edition of Denver 7 News. I'm Shannon Ogden. We're going to leave you with a line from Michael Jackson's Man in the Mirror. Quote, if you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and then make a change.